Okay, thank you for being here. Um, thank you, uh, my, the head of my department, Dr. Shakabari, for that uh, elaborate introduction. Um, today I'm going to talk on the neurobiology of obesity. He has actually made my work very easy because he has given you the breakdown. Uh, but what I'm going to tell you is the, the global the statistics. Now, it is known that more than 400 million people are obese worldwide. And in the United States, more than 23 million are obese. Now, this is why in every forum, we try to let people know about the danger of obesity. The Times Magazine carried this story a couple of years ago, warning Americans of the danger of obesity. Actually, people don't die because they have obesity. They die as a result of complications associated with obesity, such as heart disease, kidney disease, cancer of different kinds, insomnia, diabetes. Of course, with chronic diabetes, ultimately amputation will come in, blindness will come in, and other uh, disease entities. This is why in 1994, in Rockefeller University, Zhang et al. doing positional cloning was able to isolate a hormone that is called leptin from this mouse. As you can see, this mouse is of the same age with the mouse here. But what is wrong with this mouse is that there is mutation in the obesity gene that it has, resulting in the down regulation of leptin receptors in part of the brain that is called hypothalamus. So even though this mouse has a lot of white fat cells in it, which is responsible for the secretion of leptin, but leptin does not cross the blood-brain barrier to act on the feeding center and the satiety center in order to control food intake as well as um, uh, body weight. Now, the same problem is what occurs in people that have accumulated a lot of fat in the body resulting in morbid obesity, just as the one shown here. And um, it has been known that the fat cells in our body represent the largest endocrine organ. What that means is that there are a lot of bioactive chemicals that are secreted from, our, from white fat. As you can see here, there are more than 25 bioactive chemicals, but which leptin happen to be one of them. Okay. And um, if you look at these numbers here, you find out that there is tumor necrotic factor alpha and interleukin 6, which are very dangerous bioactive chemicals because these are the chemicals that will go to destroy the beta cells in the pancreas. Now, continuous destruction of beta cells in the pancreas will result in inadequate secretion of insulin, which is responsible for the regulation of uh, um, body sugar when you eat, just as you are doing. Now, resulting in type 2 diabetes. Now, what is leptin? Uh, because a lot has been said about leptin. The obese individual has a lot of leptin in them because they accumulate a lot of fat. But why is it that they have this leptin and yet leptin does not act on their feeding center in order to control the amount of food that they eat? Leptin is a satiety signal 
that will inform you just as you are eating that it's time for you to stop eating. Okay? And uh, by so doing, it fools or deceives the individual. It deceives the brain that you are full. You shouldn't eat. Now, we've seen that leptin has gone beyond, the action of leptin has gone beyond that of um, regulating food intake and body weight balance. Leptin has been shown to regulate various physiological processes in the body. Reproduction is one of them. This is why in my laboratory, the main focus of my research is on the role of leptin in obesity as well as in reproduction. <clears throat> as you say, I was very lucky to have all this training studying in Japan, and I ended up in Brent Institute, uh, University of Florida, where I had the privilege of working with two types of leptin. Now, the recombinant adeno-associated virus vector, including leptin, was isolated from E. coli. So that when this virus is injected into the animal, the animal will continue to lose weight and have aversion for food as long as that animal lives. Okay? Um, I was also lucky to work with pure recombinant adeno-associated leptin, which represents the type of leptin that is naturally secreted from the body. Now, the main problem or the main factor that causes obesity is overfeeding. I think here in the United States, the United States is the only country in the world that uh, people use food to, uh, to do competition. Just as you've seen, this individual trying to eat all this amount of uh, uh, bread and um, hot dog. Now, if you continue to eat this way, and you don't do anything to restrain yourself, uh, you end up being obese. Other factors that can predispose individuals to obesity is lack of exercise. A lot of uh, insulin, once secreted in the body, may result in insulin resistance. And um, people that are treated with insulin for type 2 diabetes, the side effect is um, uh, obesity because of uh, the fact that insulin promotes adipogenesis. Glucocorticoids is also another um, hormone that um, breaks down a lot of uh, food substrate in the body, uh, resulting in uh, fat accumulation, promoting obesity. Estrogen is female hormone that um, stimulates appetite for food, so that um, uh, probably this is why um, the rate of obesity is disproportionately distributed amongst uh, the two sexes. It is more in female than in males. Mutation in, in uh, leptin receptors, once there is down regulation, uh, down regulation of leptin receptors, even though uh, leptin may be present in the blood, but uh, there is no interaction between the receptors and, the, uh, and leptin, resulting in obvious obesity. Large fat accumulation, which is referred to as adiposity, I've shown you a slide whereby there are so many bioactive chemicals that are secreted from fat cells, which may promote obesity. So these are some of the factors that um, will obviously promote obesity, and um, we have to do everything possible to make sure that some of the things that we can control, such as overfeeding, is something that we can do in order to uh, cut down the incidence of obesity and also visit the gene. Now, leptin is one of the adipocytes, like I said earlier, on that it's secreted from fat cells. It acts on part of the hypothalamus, which is the vegetative center in the brain, particularly on the ventromedial hypothalamus. The ventromedial hypothalamus is otherwise referred to as the satiety center. That is the center that the leptin will go to stimulate. And then fooling you, deceiving you that you are full. 
that you should stop eating. On the other hand, leptin will go to another center that is, that is called the feeding center or the hunger center or the test center. Now, we have certain neurons here, neuropeptide Y, a neuron that is, express ergotyl-related peptide, including uh, ghrelin. They all go to this center to stimulate the hunger center so that uh, every time you feel hungry and then you go after food wherever you can find it. So leptin will, will act against trying to shut down that uh, uh, circuit. Now, in doing so, leptin will also, by simple diffusion, act on uh, the part of the hypothalamus that is called the paraventricular area. That is the area that controls the thermogenesis, okay, energy expenditure. Stimulate that area, and then the individual there will be increase in body metabolism, the individual will lose weight. Now, for the fact that the individual um, has high um, metabolism and then food intake is also suppressed, the end effect is that uh, body weight and food intake will be, will be controlled appropriately. Now, the preoptic area, which is the area that is also very close to the ventromedial area is also stimulated. And that is the area where you have a lot of gonadotropic releasing hormones, neurons. So once this area is stimulated, um, the releasing substance will go to stimulate the anterior pituitary, resulting in the release of these uh, uh, reproductive hormone, follicular stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. This is why uh, in working with leptin, I've been able to research into the effect of leptin on body weight control as well as um, effect on rep reproduction. So in other words, my laboratory is a, is, a, is a fertile ground for students to be trained in these two areas, depending on your interest. Now, with adiposity, resulting in the secretion of these bioactive chemicals, uh, which go the tumor, tumor the necrotic factor and uh, interleukin-6, which particularly go to destroy the, the beta cells, resulting in type 2 diabetes. Uh, type 2 diabetes, of course, because there is hyperglycemia and there is dyslipidemia, which is increased in the amount of lipid in the blood, which causes with hypertension. So in general, these are the conditions that are associated with diabetes, uh, which is in general referred to as metabolic syndrome. Okay, so there is this relationship. In fact, we often say that if there is no obesity, there is no type 2 diabetes. And type 2 diabetes represents about 90% of all cases of diabetes that um, afflict mankind. So, in other words, if we can cut down the incidence of diabetes, even by half or one third, uh, millions of lives will be saved. Now, <clears throat> I know that we are all there, um, familiar with the, how to calculate the body mass index. This is how you can go about calculating that because I do, I do check my, uh, I mean, uh, on frequent basis. Take your body weight in pounds your height in inches, and then multiply that with 703. When you do the calculation, this is the breakdown. 18.5, you're underweight, that is fine. 18.5 to 24.9, you have a normal body weight. 25 to 29.9, you're overweight. So this is the signals. You have to do something about that. If your BMI climbs to 30, between 30, 30 and 39, you're obese. Okay, and then above 40, you are morbidly obese, just as that individual that I just showed you a clip. Now, the, bro the problem associated with obesity is the fact that this individual has large amount of leptin in the blood, but leptin cannot cross the blood-brain barrier in these individuals. As a result of <coughs> increased release of free fatty acid, and triglycerides from fat cells. 
So what free fatty acid and triglyceride will do is that they will go here and tighten up this tight junction in the choroid plexus in the, in the brain, preventing any leptin from entering. So this is why the obese individual, they have large amount of <coughs> leptin in their blood, but leptin cannot cross this blood-brain barrier in order to act on the hypothalamus. So for those of us who are interested in, uh, uh, in neuro study, we've developed a technique whereby in, in rodents, we can be able to bypass this blood-brain barrier and give leptin to the part of the brain that is called the third ventricle. The third ventricle is very close to the, uh, the part of the hypothalamus that uh, controls food intake and body weight. So once leptin is injected here, very small amount, five microliters, it diffuses an effect activity here in the ventromedia uh, hypothalamus, which is the satiety center, and then in the lateral hypothalamus, which is the, uh, the hunger center or the feeding center. At the same time, leptin will also diffuse to uh, stimulate the paraventricular area here, otherwise referred to as PVN, which is the seat of thermogenesis, increasing um, <coughs> metabolism. Now, today, I'm going to talk on the, the work I did when I was a student in Japan, just one of them. Most of the work that I've done on leptin have already been published in uh, peer-reviewed scientific journals. So if you want to see some of my publications, you just, you just put my, my name. Either in Google, you Google it, all my publications will come out. So I'm only going to talk on one, and, um, <coughs> and then I will talk on um, two of the work that I did in Brain Institute at University of Florida. And then I will now talk on the work that I've done uh, for the past 12 months since I've been here. I'll make that very quick, uh, quickly because I, 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 I think um, uh, we are running out of time. I started late. Now, evidence has been presented that uh, there are certain neurons in the brain that express nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is also another neuromodulator that um, regulates various physiological processes in the body. And um, in many brain areas, like in the hypothalamus and even in the ovaries. Um, a lot of neurons that express nitric oxide coexist with leptin neurons. So we figured out that probably uh, leptin could utilize this pathway in uh, enhancing some of these actions. So what we did was that um, we had three groups of animals. Um, we made sure that we checked the estrus cycles and, and that they had regular four days estrus cycle, or which is just equivalent like the reproductive cycle in humans. Now, we withdrew food um, during diastrus. Diastrus is the, estro, is the phase whereby the animal eats a lot. So we withdrew food on diastrose phase of the estrus cycle for four days. Now, as you can see here, um, in group A here, we allow these animals to have access to food here. So this group of rats were fed at libidum. Food was withheld here, and we gave these animals common selling to act as control. On this other group, we fasted them, but gave leptin to them, IP. Now what we saw after four days when we started to take parameters, <clears throat> within the first, um, within the first um, 30 minutes, leptin started to work. We look at the effect of leptin between the first 30 minutes, one hour, two hours, four hours, six hours, eight hours, 12 hours. I think it was um, when I was in the lab for about 12 hours, that was when my professor said I should go home and eat. And when I left, I came back the, 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 the next day, the next morning to take the final uh, parameter. Now there was, starting from the first 30 minutes, there was 
a gradual decrease in food intake in the group that were treated with leptin. We also measured water intake. There was also a gradual decrease in the amount of water fed by uh, that taken in by those animals that were treated with leptin. On the body weight, there was also a gradual decrease in the in the body weight throughout the 24-hour period that we look at the effect of leptin. Now, what was interesting here is that <clears throat> during the first 12 hours, between the first 12 and 24 hours, that was when uh, these anthropometric uh, uh, parameters actually decreased significantly, starting from food, water intake, and body weight. Right. Now we went ahead and also look at the effect of um, uh, leptin on um, uh, effect of fasting and leptin repletion on um, leptin level itself. In the fasted group that were given leptin, there was gradual increase in the level of leptin in the blood. The highest level occurred uh, at 24 hours. Now, in the fasted group, which acted as um, the control group, you can see here that the level of uh, leptin actually decreased. In the fed group, leptin level increased uh, uh, throughout the period we, that we look at. Now, we were also interested in looking at the effect of um, uh, fasting and uh, leptin repletion on the level of estrogen in the blood. Now, for the control group that were fasted and given just normal selling, estrogen level decreased significantly. But in those groups that were fasted and given leptin, you can see here that leptin level increased, um, sorry, the estrogen level increased significantly. Now, food intake actually promotes um, normal level of uh, estrogen. We also went further to look at the number of um, uh, animals that actually ovulated. Okay? We used five animals per group, and we found out that in the group that were fed, all the five animals ovulated. And in the group that were fasted and given normal saline, only one out of five animals ovulated. In the group that we gave, that were fasted and given leptin, Four out of five animals ovulated. It goes to confirm the um, physiological effect of leptin on uh, reproduction. And it also shows the danger of uh, voluntary fasting or involuntary fasting on reproductive function. Um, Okay, so when I, I moved from uh, Japan to Brain Institute, that was where I had the privilege of working with uh, one of the, the well-known neuroendocrinologists, uh, Dr. S.P. Kara. Uh, in, his, in his lab, the work on leptin has gone beyond using recombinant leptin because the first work that I just talked to you was done using uh, naturally secreted leptin. In his, in his lab, he was using leptin that was isolated from E. coli. It's, it's like a virus. So you, you just need to inject only five microliters into the brain of this animal, and you'll see um, all the changes associated with it. In the first work that I, I talked about, uh, about one mil of leptin was infused, was injected IP into this animal in order to bring about that, e that effect. Now, in working with leptin, we always start by looking at the effect of leptin on body weight, which gives us an idea that, one, you've given appropriate amount of leptin. Two, that the leptin you give is enough to, uh, make, to give the physiological effect that you are interested in investigating. And this is why we, in all work that we've done, we always look at the, these anthropometric uh, parameters. Now, we use, in this work that was done in Brain Institute, we, use, um, we injected um, 
uh, a virus that was encoded uh, with leptin into the third ventricles of this animal. As you can see, the leptin treated group, these animals were fed just normal, they were given normal rat chow. Okay? No special diet was given. Uh, leptin actually decreased body weight. And uh, for the group that we gave um, the same amount of food that we gave to, uh, that were consumed by um, the leptin treated group after the first day, you can see that um, uh, their body weight also um, was suppressed. Now, for those groups that were untreated, and also for the group that we gave a green fluorescent protein just to act as control, although it is a, a virus too, but it doesn't contain um, uh, a leptin. You can see here that in these two uh, groups, the body weight actually increased significantly uh, when compared to leptin with the virus. Like I said earlier on, if you use um, this type of leptin, the chances are that this animal will continue to lose life, I mean to lose weight, um, refuse to eat or eat very little throughout the period that animal is alive. If that animal lives for two years or three years, you will continue to see this effect in this animal. This is the danger of using gene therapy, okay, in, um, that involves leptin in um, controlling body weight. Now, we also went ahead because we know that um, we went ahead and measured three hormones. We measured leptin, insulin, and ghrelin. Um, ghrelin is a hormone that is secreted from, from the stomach naturally and acts on the hunger center in the brain, stimulate um, eating. So when we um, look at the, when we measure these hormones, we choose to rat by group and look at the hormonal profiles. And um, first of all, we observe that all these animal, the hormone was secreted in postural fashion because when we took blood from this animal, we took blood every five, five minutes, over 190 minutes. One hour, 30 minutes. I remember when I was doing this experiment, we started at 10 a.m. and then finished around 10 minutes after one. So we were able to sort of be able to characterize the secretory pattern of this hormone every five, five minutes. Now, with the help of um, a software that is called cluster analysis, we were able to uh, be able to um, identify when each of these hormones were secreted, whether they were secreted at the same time when leptin was secreted. Okay, so you can see here, the arrow that corresponds with another arrow here and corresponds with another arrow here was um, counted using this uh, software. Okay, so in this, this is a, a very important experiment that we did and the observation we made was very, very um, important in the sense that it gave room to the work that is being done now all over the certain, certain specific laboratory here in the United States and around the world. And um, when we use this cluster analysis in looking at the hormonal pr profile, we saw that although um, there was no significant correlation and significant uh, synchrony between the secretion of leptin and insulin, but the disparity was even more when we compared leptin with ghrelin. Okay, what's more? Um, so we went ahead and looked at the, we measured the amplitude of, um, and the frequency of um, uh, this hormone secreted every, every five minutes. Uh, we also look at the, we count the number of pulses, and then we look at the, how long it takes between one peak and the other peak. Now, what was in interesting here was that um, it was only in the cumulative le um, levels and in the amplitude with regards to in the leptin treated group that uh, we observed uh, some significant changes. Whereas when we look at the pulse number and the pulse intervals, um, there was nothing 
that change much throughout the three groups. Now, what that suggests is that um, that the secretion of leptin, especially with insulin, uh, may occur at the same time. The parameter we used was that if it occurs, if the secretion of insulin and, and leptin differs by only five minutes, that is fine. We count that as positive. But if it differs by about 15 minutes, then there is no correlation in the secretory profile. So there is no synchrony. Now, we use, in another experiment, we use high fat diet, which is a special type of diet uh, that we use on animals in order to um, um, quickly produce obesity. We use, in the high fat diet, there are about 45% of it is made of content fat mainly. So it is easy for you to um, find out those animals that are prone to being obese and those that, are, that resist obesity. So these animals, we have two groups of rats that we put on high fat diet. Uh, we fed them for um, the first two weeks. Now within the first two weeks, some of these animals actually gain about 40 grams within the first two weeks of putting them on high fat diet. Whereas there were some animals that were also eating the same high fat diet, they were adding only five to seven grams. And then we separated those group of rats and uh, labeled them obesity resistant. Now the other animals that add an excess of about 40 grams were classified as obesity prone. Now, the, there was another group of rats that we just placed them on normal diet, which contained very low amount of, uh, um, of fat. Now, when we look at the way they were adding up body weight, you can see here that the, the OP rat, which represents the obesity prone rats, actually accumulated a lot of body weight as shown here. Whereas, the animals that we put on normal rat chow, and also the animals that were resistant to obesity, they are, you see here, they are struggling with body weight. Very little amount of body weight. So there was a significant difference between those animals that were, that were obesity prone with regards to the amount of uh, um, body weight that, that was added. Now, with regards to food intake, we also made a stunning observation because here, the obesity-prone animals and the resistance animal ate the same amount of food. And when we calculated the total uh, kilocalories, the kilocalories were exactly the same. And also, when we calculated the total kilocalories consumed by even those rats that we put on normal diet, the kilocalories were the same. Now. The question is, why is it that you have two individuals eating the same amount, the same type of food, the same amount of food? One individual will be prone to obesity, and the other uh, person will resist it. This is the this is this is uh, the point in obesity study that we believe that if we can be able to uh, to get hold of that gene that the obesity resistant animal has that will take care of the problem associated with obesity. Now, we also went ahead and looked at the, the postatized secre uh, secretory pattern of, um, of these three hormones, leptin, insulin, and ghrelin, in these animals. As you can see here, all this, the, the secretory pattern in these animals, because blood was also taken over every five, five minutes um, through 190 minutes, you can see that the security pattern here is positive in all the, uh, the different groups, irrespective of the diet. Now, but what was different here was the height of amplitude in the obesity-prone animals, which were actually exaggerated, and also as well as the cumulative level in these hormones. 
Now, there was no difference. We didn't see any significant difference in the pulse number and the uh, interpulse interval. Now, what this shows us is that um, um, probably that the pacemaker responsible for the control of the amplitude of secretion of these three hormones may reside within the hypothalamus. Whereas the, the frequency of secretion, the pacemaker responsible for the frequency of uh, secretion as well as the interpulse interval and the parameters that were not significant may reside within the tissue of origin. That is where the hormones are actually secreted. For instance, leptin should reside within the white fat cell and in the case of ghrelin, it should reside within the stomach. In the in case of insulin, it should reside within the, the, the pancreas. Now, why I have to choose these two um, research that I did in Brain Institute is that when we use cluster analysis just as we did in the first experiment and try to match the, the hormonal profile of these three hormones, uh, many of the, the peaks between leptin and insulin, there were many of them actually matched, which shows that leptin and insulin could be secreted at the same time in the body. Okay, like I said, the way we uh, we we, uh, we assess that was that if it is preceded by about five minutes, we count that as positive. But if it is beyond 15 minutes, then there is no correlation, there is no synchrony. So that gave us an idea that probably. Maybe there could come a time when leptin, leptin might be important, might work in concert or in synergism with insulin. And uh, two years later, when I left that lab, that professor went ahead and um, with that, because we always had um, um, a seminar in our lab every week. We talk about this and um, if it, it, um, the conclusion was that even though I would not be around, he would go ahead and look at the effect of uh, leptin on type 2 diabetes. And in, 2000, in 2006, he came up with a publication in Science that leptin can be used in treating type 2 diabetes. He was the first person to come up with that uh, observation. But the good news is that today, uh, the, there are a group of uh, researchers in the um, University of Texas, the Southwest uh, Medical uh, Unit, who has gone a step further to show that leptin can be used in treating type 1 diabetes in mice. So today, uh, clinical trials are going on, which is being sponsored by a pharmaceutical company, Emilin. And um, we hope that leptin will be useful in human one day in, in treating this diabetes and type 1 diabetes. So um, I'm, not going, I'm not giving myself credit, and probably Dr. Kara is not, will not receive any credit. Only those uh, guys in the uh, University of Texas, because they took it um, out of the confinement of their laboratory, they now involve a, a pharmaceutical company. They are the people that will be seen as those who, I mean, who discover that. But the work I did there gave us that perspective. So um, to summarize my work, when I, I, when I came here, uh, you know, it took time for, you, for me to set up my lab with the, with the money given me here. And um, um, in general, I didn't have uh, the type of equipment that we, we had in Japan and in the Brain Institute to do my work here. So I started with the, the normal leptin, the, recombin uh, the recombinant leptin. I was trying to uh, sort of uh, bring back the type of work I did in Brain Institute, the last one that involved uh, um, high fat diet, okay? We use a virus and bring about all the changes that I have told you. Now, I ask myself, since I'm here, can I use uh, the, um, a normal recombinant leptin in um, also showing the same effect? So um, when I started working, uh, we look at the, <coughs> the effect of a high fat diet on um, body weight as well as um, on other parameters. Uh, we, we fed these animals for six weeks with high-fat diet. On a, another group was just given uh, 
normal uh, rat chow, and we gave saline to it. Um, there was another group that uh, we also put them on high fat diet and also gave them saline. And there was another group that we gave the same amount of food that was consumed by the group that we treated with leptin. Uh, we observed them over that period and um, um, take note that leptin was given into the third ventricle with that procedure that I showed you. Um, we look at the body weight. As you can see here that those animals that ate high fat diet but received saline instead of leptin, their body weight actually went up. Now for the group that were placed on normal chow and even those that were perfect and the group that was given leptin, as you can see three groups here, they were, their body weight actually struggled to increase and in fact they always had uh, their they had almost a parallel uh, type of uh, body weight. So which goes to show once again that even with um, recombinant leptin, once given appropriately, can also um, bring down suppressed body weight, even in those animals that are given high energy type of diet. Now we also look at the food intake. Uh, those animals that um, were ob obesity prone, um, you can see here, um, they ate a lot. Oh, sorry, I take that back. The animal that um, uh, had a normal uh, rat chow and they were given selling, they ate a lot of food in grams, in terms of grams per 24 hours, because we were measuring that every two, two days. And um, in the animal that we gave a high fat diet and gave selling, this was the amount of food they ate in grams, which was lower than uh, those that were put on a normal child. But those ones that we treated with leptin ate less in terms of grams. Now take note that these animals were eating food that, were, that was packed with uh, a lot of fat. So it makes sense that they were eating less um, against those animals that ate uh, a normal uh, child. But what was interesting here was that even though the you know, when, when you calculate the total amount of uh, kilocalories and multiply that with the, uh, with the energy one gram of fat uh, produces, which is more in the, in the rats that uh, ate high fat diet, they tend to zero out. Okay, there was no significant difference in the, the total kilocalories that these animals in all these three groups ate. So when we uh, open up the abdomen of this animal because one of the pathways that leptin uh, utilizes is to deplete their abdominal fat, the white fat, the white adipose tissue, which is the source of uh, the problem associated with the obesity. We found out that in the leptin treated group, the white fat was depleted compared to the control group here that ate high fat diet and we just gave them normal selling. Okay, so this is uh, one of the ways uh, that uh, um, we were able to see the efficacy of uh, recombinant leptin. And when we actually extracted these um, white adipose tissue and weighed them uh, in terms of grams, you can see here the high fat uh, treated group that we're given selling, there was a lot of white fat that were, that were harvested. So leptin um, actually helped in depletion of the white fat, which is one of the the benefits of using leptin in, uh, in trying to control the obesity. Now, I did mention that leptin does not only act on the feeding center, it also acts on the paraventricular nucleus in the hypothalamus, which is the seat of thermogenesis, which uh, controls metabolism. Now, it does this by stimulating another uh, protein that is called the brown adipose tissue that is located here in the lower back, in fact, in the supraclavicular region. And um, if you can see here, this is brown adipose tissue, which was uh, well expressed in the leptin treated group. In the other group that were eating um, high fat diet and giving selling, um, very little amount, if none, was uh, stimulated. Okay, so um, how the paraventricular nucleus work is to stimulate this part of the of the body resulting in the expression of brown adipose tissue, which uh, 
helps in increasing uh, body metabolism. And this is one of the ways by which leptin acts to bring down or control body weight. Now we also went ahead and looked at, the, uh, mind you, these animals were fed for only uh, six weeks, uh, which I know uh, from what I have I've learned that um, it's not enough to uh, make these animals uh, diabetic. So uh, as at the time of decapitation, these animals were still eating. So in all the groups, um, there was no significant uh, change in the, in the blood glucose level, which was within the normal range. We also went ahead and looked at the effect of the leptin treatment on insulin. You know, as we all know, insulin resistance is a hallmark in obesity. It's what brings about all the problems. Now, leptin was able to suppress uh, the um, secretion of insulin significantly, um, which shows that leptin is a very, very effective agent in uh, controlling insulin resistance and hence being very useful in the treatment of uh, diabetes of all types. We also went ahead and measured the um, blood level of adiponectin. Uh, interestingly, adiponectin is a, a very important hormone that is also secreted from fat cell, but works differently in the body, okay? It suppresses body weight increase, but using a different mechanism by stimulating events in the paraventricular area, increasing thermogenesis without affecting food intake. So we were able to also uh, observe that leptin could stimulate the secretion of adiponectin and probably acting in synergism in the, in the treatment of diabetes. <laughs> now, the work that I just discussed is what we've done so far. A lot of work still, is still ongoing. Um, so this is just like a, pre a preliminary result of the work that I've done here since uh, I've been here this while. Now, in conclusion, as you can all see, I think the problem associated with obesity, as you all agree with me, is the insufficiency of uh, leptin expression in the hypothalamus. Because if you have enough leptin in the hypothalamus, um, body weight will be controlled, food intake will be controlled, and uh, other physiological processes in the body will go on normally, including, including reproduction. Now, take note that overfeeding is a major factor in obesity. And this is why in the neuroscience community, we always argue whether with the type of amount of food that we have here in America, whether leptin can be effective in humans here in America. Now, compared to if leptin were to be used in France, where you have a lot of fruits in France and less amount of food. So the, the problem associated with obesity uh, is the insatiable um, taste for food. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, good food around here in America and they're very cheap. Um, you go to a restaurant in Manhattan, you pay only $5 and you, they say you eat all what you can. So some people go there and uh, with only $5, they can stay there a whole day because nobody will drive them out. Right. So. Um, Please take note of the overfeeding, which is a very factor, and also visit the gym, which is also an important factor that will bring down your body weight. Now, the future research. Um, having made that initial observation in Brain Institute, um, I believe that other than insulin and leptin, probably there could be other hormones that um, can act in concert with leptin to bring about, to reverse all the changes associated with obesity and even in type 2 diabetes recently and type 1 diabetes. So we shall go ahead and characterize other key metabolic hormones like a tyrosine, adiponectin, resistin, um, we shall in include ghrelin this time and insulin and as well as leptin and see and use the cluster analysis uh, software which I, I mentioned earlier on uh, to see to characterize the alternate secretory pattern here We've written this work and sent it to NIH. I confirmed that that um, application was forwarded today. So if NIH funds this project, um, that will be the, uh, my main focus for the next three years in my lab. I give thanks to uh, Brittany. She's here. She's the graduate student that is working with me. Um, I also thank Heli Templeton. She's the undergraduate student that is also working in my lab. 
I thank Dr. Bro because um, Dr. Bro is um, is an expert in uh, type one diabetes and he's a professor of endocrinology. Uh, sorry, endocrinology in the in the Villain Hospital there. Uh, he has been very helpful because um, um, here in, uh, in in public health, uh, unfortunately, uh, I don't we don't have a gamma counter that can enable me to do radio immunization to measure these um, hormones. Uh, it was uh, when I went across uh, Franklin, the state of Franklin oversight, that was where I met uh, Dr. Bro, who is using ELISA in his laboratory to analyze these hormones. So I really give credit to him. I also thank those students because they have been coming. Uh, this is uh, F uh, Frederick, this is Templeton, and this is uh, Kali, and this is Morgan, this is Stacy, the student who recorded, who secretly recorded uh, this procedure without my knowledge. And also thank um, uh, which uh, I mean, different students came to my lab and um, they took this picture and sent it to me. Uh, that the people that uh, have also helped to spread the message about uh, what is going on in my laboratory and I'm very happy that many students are responding positively. So for those of you that are here who are students, um, if you're interested in brain research and you want to know more about leptin, uh, as you can see, we can look at various areas of leptin. Okay, uh, on reproduction, on uh, body weight control, and uh, in energy balance, um, we can continue to work together. Thank you. I, I lost my voice. I don't know what happened today, and I, I was screaming. And I hope uh, didn't that didn't uh, affect your hearing. Thank you.